Like many intruder pilots in Vietnam, he would not make it back over the beach. I told Don Eaton, my bomber navigator, I said, we're gonna have to get out. And I said, eject, slapped his leg, and he ejected, and I followed two seconds thereafter. We watched the airplane, uh, he, he floated over this way. He was a, a light young guy, 135 pounds, I was 200 pounds, and uh, he floated down like a, like a leaf, and I floated down like a ton of rocks. When I looked down, the men were coming out with their rifles, uh, the soldiers ready to, to uh, capture me. So and as soon as I hit the ground, which was in a rice paddy area, I got rid of my parachute, got rid of my, har my helmet, and looked up the hill where Don was still coming down. I couldn't go up that hill. It was a big grassy hill because the enemy was coming from this way. I turned around and looked this way, and it was a big jungle mountain. So I had to run through the rice paddy into the jungle area, and I found an animal den of some sort, a tiger hole or something, and crawled in that and uh, waited until sunset, until nightfall, and then I evaded up the hill. But there were people all around looking. I could hear uh, people within 20 or 50 feet of me. A safe ejection and ultimate rescue has given Rear Admiral Becker a deep appreciation of those unsung heroes of naval aviation. The parachute rigger is trusted uh, with your life. He is the one that packs your parachute. You never appreciate him until you have to use it. Also, the uh, AME, we, they call them, the Aviation Structural Mechanic, who is responsible for the seat to operate properly. So you never appreciate those people until you have to use it. And then we came back and we bought uh, each of the parachute packer. We looked at, we had to find out who packed the parachute, and we had to buy him a bottle of uh, whatever he drank. The rescue of downed intruder pilots is often fraught with difficulty. On one occasion, a Marine A-6 pilot was on a bombing mission over the Ho Chi Minh Trail when a surface-to-air missile crippled his plane. The bombardier navigator was killed, and the pilot was forced to eject into the inhospitable jungle below. North Vietnamese troops, aware that the pilot was present in the area, awaited the arrival of the rescue team in the hopes of striking an even greater blow to the Americans. The rescue force knew a bad situation when they saw one. Enemy troops had enveloped the pilot on three sides, and they needed him to travel east before he could be safely rescued. However, the problem was how to relay this message to the pilot without it being intercepted by North Vietnamese listening to the same radio frequency. Then one of the rescue pilots came up with an ingenious solution. He created a message that only a naval aviator could understand. The message stated, we think you need a cat before we can give you your trap. The wind is in the first three of your SSN. Cyclic ops is now. Do you understand? The message simply stated that the pilot needed to catapult to a new location before he could be trapped, meaning to be safely rescued. The first three digits of the downed pilot's social security number happened to be 090, which is due east, the direction the rescue forces wanted him to go. After four days in the jungle, the young Marine pilot was finally rescued. October in Vietnam marks the beginning of the monsoon season. It was during this period of blanket cloud cover and torrential downpours that the intruder had its first chance to truly shine. Enemy troops once given a reprieve from air attack when the monsoon rain set in could now expect to be hit in the worst of all weather conditions. weather capability of the A6A came both from the strength of its airframe and the power of its electronics. The digital navigational equipment gives the pilot and his bombardier navigator a clear view of the terrain on an onboard display screen deemed almost space age in 1965. On a sunny day, this display is almost redundant, but in bad weather, it gives the intruder crew a powerful advantage. Deeply enshrouded in a thick layer of clouds, the intruder is in its element. 
Hurtling headlong through the monsoon rains, the bombardier navigator fixes on a target that the two men will never see with their own eyes. The intruder is not a very fast aircraft, and its unelegant airframe has given it the dubious distinction of being the ugliest plane in the Navy. But it is incredibly strong, and it is capable of withstanding a beating that would knock most other conventional military planes from the sky. The heart of the intruder's strength comes from a box beam that is milled from a solid block of aluminum alloy in a manner of construction one would associate more with a house than an airplane. This solid beam passes from one wing through the fuselage to the other wing and is what gives the plane its strength and ability to carry such a massive load of bombs. The effectiveness of the intruder in all weather conditions pleased no one more than the Marines on the ground. In the past, bad weather had meant the absence of close air support. As the clouds moved in, the men on the ground could be certain of one thing. They were on their own. With the A-6 now in the fleet, those days were over. The Marines could now expect full air cover anytime, any weather. The all-weather capability of the intruder was no accident, but was rather the result of the lessons learned in an earlier conflict, the Korean War. The conflict in Korea saw the largest deployment of U.S. ground forces since World War II. From the Incheon landing and on throughout the entire war, troops on the ground depended on air cover to survive. For the U.S. Navy, Korea was the perfect tactical environment. It was a peninsula that could be enveloped by carrier task forces on three sides. The A-1 Sky Raider was the Navy's workhorse attack plane during the entire war. However, the volatile weather over Korea exposed a weakness that frustrated military planners. Aircraft could simply not operate effectively in bad weather. And in the winter of 1951, U.S. carriers often spent more of their time steering around snowstorms than they did launching planes. With these lessons learned, the Navy made clear its need for an all-weather attack plane. The Grumman Corporation, no stranger to naval aircraft, joined the host of other manufacturers in an intense design competition. In 1957, they built a full-scale mock-up of their prototype. And a year later, they were given a $100 million production contract. The decade of the 60s brought with it a sense of limitless optimism in what America could achieve. There was no greater symbol of this than the Lockheed SR-71. This futuristic-looking aircraft was designed to take man higher and faster than ever before. In contrast to the sleek SR-71, the A6A Intruder is a study in practicality. It was not designed to break any speed records, nor could it attain breathtaking altitudes. With its bulbous nose and odd-looking fuselage, it was truly unglamorous. And in an era when America was reaching for the stars, the unassuming Intruder quietly entered squadron service. However, over the cloud-covered mountains of North Vietnam, the intruder was anything but quiet. During the monsoon season of 1966, it flew 40% of all combat missions for the Navy. But the plane does not fly itself. The pilot must get aboard the ship, whether the seas are calm or when massive waves come crashing over the 60-foot bow. From the time of the Second World War to the war in the Gulf, getting back to the ship has remained the primary challenge of the naval aviator. Standing on the deck, I've seen some pretty colorful stuff in bad weather. 
Uh, one night in particular in a thunderstorm, uh, the plane could not see the ship, but we could see it from the deck.